When you think, what are the best satirical animated shows in the history of television? Of course, The Simpsons comes to mind, or South Park, or Family Guy, or Rick and Morty, even The Flintstones. All are worthy challengers for the throne. But for my money, I won't give it to the Boondocks. And although it had a very short and sporadic run, I still think it's the best thing that was ever on television in terms of satire of American culture, considering that it was spoofing hip hop culture and hip hop culture became part of the larger American culture. So allow me to take a look at the Boondocks from the very beginning. Chapter one, the origin of the Boondocks. The artistic brilliance, which is the Boondocks, all begins with this man, Aaron Magruder. And he created the Boondocks as a college student at the University of Maryland, where it was first published in the school's newspaper, called the Diamondback, in 1996. It became an underground and cult favorite almost immediately, with syndication in many comic strips in some major newspapers, as well as appearing in the Source magazine. The story you should know very well by now, it concentrates on two brothers, Huey and Riley Freeman. Huey, age 10, and Riley, age 8, are from the south side of Chicago. And for reasons that are not fully explained, they move from the south side of Chicago out of state to a nice, quiet, tranquil suburb, where they go to live with their grandfather on Timid Deer Lane. So it's a fish out of water story where these two brothers had to adjust to this new environment. Now before we go any further, let's look at what makes the Boondocks so original and so unique. It's inspired by other comic strips such as Doom Doomsbury, probably one of the smartest comics in the history of political satire. It probably went over a lot of people's heads, but if you got it, you got it. The Boondocks is also inspired by Charlie Brown and Peanuts. Being that the lead characters in it are kids, but they're going through an existential crisis. You expect to find a middle-aged people, not young kids. But somehow, the writer is able to find humor in it. Charles Schultz with Peanuts and Aaron Magruder with The Boondocks. As I said before, it spoofs American culture by narrowing down to hip-hop culture. The Boondocks is capable of celebrating hip-hop as a loud and powerful instrument of change, but it also criticizes hip-hop pop at its worst, it's frivolous, misogynistic, and ignorant. You can see that Eric Magruder is clearly a fan of hip hop and appreciates it. Magruder could accurately criticize hip hop culture because he's of the culture. He's not an outsider. His criticism was like a loved one that you want to see do better. So the biggest influences on the boondocks are Doonesbury, Charlie Brown, hip hop culture itself, and of course, anime. So from the very beginning, you can see that his style incorporated Japanimation looking artwork. It seemed to come from an organic place like this is just stuff that he appreciated as a kid that he learned to draw from. Generation Z of people that were born after 2000 have fully embraced anime and read the manga comics. But Aaron Magruder is a Generation Xer like myself. So only the weird kids that were at the table playing D&D &D and using the internet in 1995 before anybody even knew what that was were the type that were in the anime. So for a college student to have a comic strip that is hip hop centric, this inspired by anime and told in an uncompromising satirical style now that's way ahead of its time now back to the continuity the boys are moved to this suburb called woodcrest on timid deer lane the grandfather has certain rules and expectations for them to live by but the kids are very defiant and that defiance is coming from two very different places the older brother named Huey is named after Huey P. Newton, the co-founder of the Black Panther Party. And like his namesake, Huey views himself as a black revolutionary. He opposes white supremacy and capitalism. He fully embraces black liberation, but he's also very frustrated that other black people can't see the urgency of his cause. It makes him grumpy, moody, and isolated. And a lot of family and friends view him as just being paranoid. His brother Riley, on the other hand, is fully embracing of hip hop culture, but the worst parts of it. You know the parts of hip hop that celebrate the greed, the lust, the boasting, and the quick to resort to violence tactics. You settle a dispute, always making it worse. Riley thinks it's cool to hang on to the every word of the idiot rapper of the month, not realizing just how naive he is in Gullible. So the key essence of the boondocks which drives the whole story is the different ideologies of both of the brothers trying to coexist with a grandfather who definitely doesn't understand them. Important side characters are Tom the lawyer who's proud of being the assistant district attorney. He's all about following rules and having a sense of order. But he's also riddled with anxiety and doesn't seem to have any cultural awareness which winds up making him the butt of a lot of jokes. He's married to a white woman named Sarah who is also a lawyer and she seems to be the voice of reason in Tom's life so he won't excessively worry or overreact to things. And then there's their mixed race daughter Jasmine. She is depicted as being sweet, innocent, and somewhat naive. She's about the same age as Huey and spends a lot of time hanging around him. It's implied that she might have a crush on him, but it seems to be mostly that she's hanging around because he says all these weird, strange things. And she thinks it's actually kind of funny most of the time. If nothing else is entertaining. And Huey really doesn't mind her hanging around because it gives him an audience. I mean, his granddad and his brother aren't paying attention to his plans for black liberation. The Boondocks did run into some controversy only two years into its publication as a syndicated comic strip because 
because it was very critical of the Iraq war. It was accurately stating just how gangster the Bush administration was and playing this for a bunch of chumps. Some newspapers wound up dropping the boondocks altogether, where the strip is still basically a cult hit. But the banning in several newspapers winds up becoming a national story which has people seek out what was the controversy about in the first place, therefore making the source material even that much more popular. That brings us to Chapter 2, The Boondocks Animated Series. You may not know this, but Fox had the most interest in developing an animated show for The Boondocks. They even ordered a pilot. Could you imagine The Boondocks coming on right after The Simpsons? It would have been a very interesting contrast. The deal didn't quite work out, so Adult Swim, part of the Cartoon Network, stepped in and aired the show. Instead of Fox owning it, then Warner Brothers owns it because Warner Brothers is the parent company of the Cartoon Network. And let's get real here. The Boondocks is more comfortable being on cable television because they can keep it unapologetically raw. Fox may tone it down a little bit for network television, like removing the N-word. So it all worked out in the end, and The Boondocks made its debut in November of 2005 with the episode The Garden Party, where Granddad is invited to a very swanky garden party being held by Ed Wunsler Sr. He tries to tell the boys to be on their best behavior, but of course things don't work out that way. Huey gets on the microphone and gets in front of the people and shares his revolutionary ideas with these very affluent and mostly white attendees. And Riley gets in trouble by sneaking off with Ed Wunsler's grandson, Edward III, and causing mayhem by shooting Eddie with a loaded weapon suggested by Eddie so he can try out a bulletproof vest. Granddad tries to apologize on behalf of Riley, but the host, Ed Wunsler Sr., isn't even worried about it. He knows that his grandson is a chaotic, reckless psychopath and it seems to be part of the family business. So the fact that this episode is first makes sense. It establishes the type of trouble that the two brothers were getting into. Their fish out of water status, their grandfather trying to hold all of it together. We're introduced to Ed Wunster Sr. who's the big bad of the show and his grandson Ed Wunster III who's the chaos agent. We're also introduced to one of the breakout characters of the show uh, Uncle Ruckus, a self-hating black man, which I'm going to discuss more in this video later. Allow me to give some credit to the voice actors while I'm here. Both Huey and Riley are voiced by the incredible, ultra-talented Regina King. She's Hollywood royalty now. She's been in this business for over 40 years. She was given a big platform as a child actress on the show 227, which was a vehicle for the actress Martha Gibbs after the Jeffersons ran out. Regina made appearances in Boys in the Hood, Poetic Justice, How Stella Got a Groove Back, Ray, Miss Congeniality, the Western, The Harder They Fall on Netflix, and she won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress in If Bill Street Could Talk. She made her director debut in the indie film One Night in Miami. This is just a small subset of her career. It's a lot more than this. She said doing the voice of Huey is just her regular speaking voice, and to do Riley, she just goes up an octave. And this shows how much talent that she has. She's able to capture the essence of two different characters that are so distinctively different. The character of Granddad is voiced by the late John Witherspoon. He made a star as a comedian in Los Angeles in the 1970s. He had a small role in House Party where he calls Public Enemy Public Enema. He stole the show in the movie Boomerang with his mushroom outfit. He played the father of the Wayans brothers in their TV show. And most famously, he plays Ice Cube's father in the Friday movies. Damn! John passed in 2019 and he will be missed. And he'll always be remembered. Now let's get back to some key episodes. With one of the most controversial episodes ever in the history of television, Episode 2, The Trial of Robert Kelly. In the early 2000s, when R. Kelly was taking liberties with a minor, he decided to tape his crimes. I mean, bruh. Oh, Lord. The Boondocks does some really over-the-top dark comedy in this. The brothers are on two different sides of the controversy. Huey is ashamed that the black community is all rallying around a pedophile, but Riley comes out and fully supports R. Kelly, defending him by saying if that girl didn't want to get peed on, she should have got the hell out the way. Throughout the episode, R. Kelly wears a Zorro mask, which is a spoof of something he actually did showing up to an award show. Tom the lawyer is the prosecutor of R. Kelly, of course, but he gets destroyed in court by the defense lawyer of R. Kelly, which is voiced by Adam West. That's the actor who once played Batman back in the 1960s. Rest in peace. This episode pulls no punches. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. If you like dark comedy, then this is for you. Then there's the episode of Guest Hoes Coming to Dinner, where a lonely grandpa falls in love with a much younger woman, and she's exploiting him by just using him as a sugar daddy. But in the plot twist, we learn that she's just a prostitute who's hiding out from her pimp, a guy named, a pimp named Slickback. Voiced by, you guessed it, Cat Williams, and it is knee-slapping hilarious. Another fan favorite is The Story of Gangstalicious. He's supposed to be a fictional rap star, which is voiced by the real-life rap star, Most Def. This story is back in the news lately because of the arrest of Puff Daddy. There just so happens to be a lot of similarities between Puff Daddy and this character. Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, Diddy, whatever you want to call it. Diddy assaulted music exec Steve Stout with a champagne bottle. Gangstalicious did the same thing. Diddy loved fashion and created his own clothing line. 
gave Delicious Love fashion and created his own clothing Diddy was not so secretly gay all this time and was involved in some strange rituals. Allegedly. Gay Delicious turns out to be not so secretly gay and he's involved in some strange things as well. And for the record, there's nothing wrong with being gay. It's just that Diddy was involved in acts that were not consensual. Allegedly. So was the Boondocks trying to warn us about Diddy 20 years before everything came to a hilt? There's a lot of furious debate about that. Did they know and have some inside information? Or were they like the Simpsons and just prophets and could predict the future by just coincidence? And then they do another episode called the Huey Freeman Christmas, which is the spoof of a Charlie Brown Christmas, in which Huey writes and directs a school play called The Adventures of Black Jesus, but he gets interference from the school principal, of course. This show gets a cameo from the real-life Quincy Jones, who does the music arrangement for the play. Rest in peace, Quincy. You were one of the great ones. There's an episode called Return of the King. That in this universe, Martin Luther King wasn't assassinated. He was shot, but he didn't die. He was just in a coma. He wakes up 30 years later, and he's disappointed in the progress of black people. And in some aspects, he feels that we actually went backwards. I know one of my favorite episodes is The Itis, in which Granddad takes some of his soul food recipes and decides to make a restaurant under that name. And he parts with Wunstler to do it. Huey thinks it's a bad idea because it will destroy the health of the community. And of course, he turns out to be right. Then there's the episode The Block is High in which Jasmine starts up a lemonade stand to try to make money to buy a pony. Of course, Munster shows up and exploits her. All the episodes I just mentioned are all just season one, which has 15 episodes, which ends with The Passion of Reverend Ruckus, in which Uncle Ruckus spreads the word of white Jesus with the intention of getting into white heaven. The Uncle Ruckus character, if you don't know him, is an aging handyman. He is an avatar for every self-hating black man you ever knew. For example, Clarence Thomas, Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, Mark Robinson, the Republican nominee for governor in North Carolina. Thank God he lost. Byron Donald is a congressman from Florida who had the audacity to say that black families were better off under Jim Crow. For him to say that was offensive, for him to be married to a white woman and saying that is doubly offensive. The Uncle Rooker's character is tragically hilarious. He claimed he had to reverse what Michael Jackson had with Vialigo. He had re -Vialigo. Michael Jackson got lighter, he got darker. Another character worth mentioning is Thugnificent. This character has elements of the real life rapper Ludacris. Being that he got popular and making a whole bunch of songs about booty and hoes. The show actually was in talks to have Ludacris actually voice the character, but those discussions broke down so they just had one of the writers in the show voice the character. The character also has some elements of 50 Cent in him. Is the leader of the Lethal Interjection crew. Very similar to 50 Cent's G unit. G unit had his medallion and Lethal Interjection had theirs. Over the course of the series we see the character rise to popularity and and drop like a rock and when it's all over he winds up getting a day job working for UPS. The Boondocks was so controversial it has the distinction of having three banned episodes. In season 2 episode 14 called The Hunger Strike in which Huey goes on a hunger strike in protest of the programming at BET. In season 2 episode 15 The Uncle Ruckus Reality Show in which a film crew from BET follows Uncle Ruckus around showing his day to day life. Both of these episodes are now banned from syndication due to threats of a lawsuit from BET in real life. The third banned episode is from season 3 episode number eight called Pause. It tells the story of Winston Jerome, a creator of black stage plays, consisting of black stereotypes and buffoonery in which he dresses in drag as an older woman. And it turns out later that Winston Jerome is an undercover homosexual predator. Of course, that was just a little bit too close to home for Tyler Perry, who complained and got the episode banned. My recommendation is to get the first three seasons on DVD. They're all uncut and uncensored. So all the cuss words that are beeped out on TV, you can hear them. And you get to see those three banned episodes. Now there is a fourth season of the Boondocks but I wouldn't recommend that one because Aaron Magruder, its creator and lead writer of the show, had left over creative differences with Cartoon Network. So I wouldn't recommend season four at all, but seasons one, two, and three are a must-have. Now, before I close, there's a big question to ask about the Boondocks. Is it going to be rebooted? Isn't it true that in the age of Trump that Huey's defiance against the government and the powers to be are really needed right now? What changes would they have to make in the show to make up for the loss of John Witherspoon? I don't think you simply can just recast Granddad. It as narrative plays at once their senior also has passed. How do you replace him? And Charlie Murphy, who plays Ed Wensler III, he too has also passed another major character. So tell me, do you think that the Boondocks should be rebooted for the Trump era? And what could they do to get around the deaths of the voice actors of three major characters? For now, speak up in the comment section and go back and watch some of these episodes. You should be seeing an end screen now about Watchmen, a comic book adaptation of a comic of the same name, in which Regina King plays a superhero called Sister Knight. Until next time, this is Comic Killer 72 for Comic Power saying bye-bye.